Hola, ¿cómo están? Yo soy Karim Sabat de PowerMetal.cl, el podcast live junto a mi, el maestro de la música, el Cortinas, don Francisco Pancho, el grandioso Pérez. ¿Cómo estás, Pancho? ¿Qué tal? ¿Qué tal? ¿Todo bien por aquí, tú? Bien, aquí en, en, el, en el invierno ariqueño. Te juro que todavía no entiendo cuándo va a llegar el invierno porque en este momento veo a harta gente en traje de baño, bañándose en la playa. No sé qué pasa en este mundo. Aquí yo acá, pero bueno. Pero bueno, la, para los que no saben, hoy día tenemos un programa, o siempre los programas especiales, que tenemos al gran Francisco Pérez para entrevistar una de las personas que hemos estado hace tiempo tratando de ubicar, tratando de contactar, el gran George Apalodimas, conocido por su trabajo, por ser el fundador y su proyecto Sacred Outcry, que ya comentamos, que comentamos durante este año y que creemos actualmente, probablemente para mí el mejor disco de Power Metal es lo que da el año y, y creo no estar perdido. Sí, no, eh, vale. Así que, eh, bueno, vamos a, vamos a saludar a nuestros auspiciadores que no nos ponen ni un peso. Esta vez es de Trooper, porque estaba barata. Eso, la verdad, estaba muy barata en el y, Jumbo. Y, está... y Peroni. Así que suene y demos la bienvenida al gran George Apalodimas, que lo vamos a poner en pantalla grande. Eh, no, así no. Así. así je... Hi, George, how are you? <laughs> Hi, guys. Very nice to be here. Thank you for the invitation and, uh, you know, always a good time to have a beer, right? <laughs> yes. Eh, <laughs> bueno, eh, para la gente que no lo sabe, normalmente el programa yo hago las preguntas en español. El gran Francisco Pérez, que habla mucho mejor inglés que yo, va a estar traduciendo y así iremos tratando que suceda esta entrevista que tenemos considerada una hora. Así que nada más. Eh, let's start the interview. So, eh, George, eh, básicamente... Eh, Bien, eh, welcome to Power Metal That's Here, the podcast live. Eh, quiero felicitarlo, eh, dile Francisco, porque mm -hmm. el tremendo trabajo de Power Metal que sacó este año, eh, Towers of Gold, eh, que yo considero que es el mejor trabajo de Power Metal que se ha hecho en lo que va del año. Ok, uh, first we want to congratulate you because uh, the album is just amazing. It's probably the best Power Metal album we've heard this year. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Uh, you know, it's uh, great uh, when, when you hear people, you know, uh, really liking what uh, you strive for for like uh, two or three years. It's uh, it's always great. So thank you very much. Uh, I really enjoy. You know, I had a we had a great time uh, making it, and uh, you know, the feedback we, we've been getting is uh, amazing. So it uh, you know gives us an extra boost for uh, for the future, and uh, it's nice. It's nice, you know, to feel appreciated. <laughs> Eh, bueno, nos no dice que eh, la recepción del álbum ha sido muy buena y que es muy bonito ver eh, que a la gente le ha gustado el disco y que al final todo este apoyo que ha recibido es un boost para, 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 para seguir más adelante con, haciendo la música. Eh, Francisco, mira, eh, la primera pregunta quiero saber un poco más de Safe It Outright. Vamos a entrar porque esta, no sé cuánta entrevista ha hecho George sobre su proyecto, pero me gustaría saber cuándo eh, parte Secret Outcry, por qué pasó tanto tiempo, entiendo que la banda se formó en el año 98, y cuál fue la inspiración detrás del nombre Secret Outcry. Um, ok, so, uh, first, uh, uh, first of all, uh, the, the, the project started in, uh, in 98, yeah. right? Uh, ¿Puedes repetir de nuevo, Karim? ¿Por qué tanto tiempo? ¿Por qué tanto tiempo? Why so much, so much time between uh, the, the beginning of the project and... Uh, well, the, uh, the band uh, first came to be in uh, late 90s, uh, 98, uh, 99, we, we recorded one demo with uh, three songs and a cover of uh, Metallica from the Beltos. You know, we were okay. very young uh, at, the, at the time. It was uh, mostly, you know, a project that we did as friends from school, etc. We were young metalheads that we wanted to, you know, experiment with uh, music and uh, try to see what we could... Uh, Uh, do uh, we had some line lineup changes and then we had the you know uh, the basic lineup of for those years we were active from like 99 to 2004 in that period we we played live uh, we supported the uh, doomsort for example when they first visited greece you know it was uh, the highlight of our live career uh, and we started recording the, um, the the first version of done for all time <coughs> But uh, we had some issues because we were really inexperienced with, uh, you know, in regards to, to how um, 
making an album works because it's totally different, especially in that time, because, you know, now it's a totally different thing, you know, with all the technology and the internet and you can do, you can work remotely. Uh, back then, uh, you, you didn't have that. In the early 2000s, you had to go into the studio, you had to pay and you had to record and you had to have people that could advise you uh, better because, you know, you don't know, so you need some uh, guidance. And we were unlucky in, the, in those departments. So we, we actually, um, at some point, came to a halt around 2003 after we had finished recording that for a time. And, uh, you know, we weren't really happy with the end result, although the songs were pretty much the same as the album that came out in 2020. But, uh, you know, it, it wasn't, we had lost a bit of the spark because it took us like three years to record the whole thing. There was some mix-ups in the studios. We recorded the drums three times. We recorded the rhythm guitars two times, the solos three times. It was uh, chaotic. So we pretty much uh, came to a halt because, uh, you know, we wanted to regroup and uh, start composing. We had ideas because the songs were already old at that point. And we had ideas that we wanted to, uh, to, to try for the second album, for example. But uh, after that point, our, our singer, our, our original singer, had to move back to his home country because he, he was here to study. And uh, we pretty much drifted apart and uh, the band, you know, after 2004 or five, we never played again. Yeah, and yeah. we... Uh, do, do you want some time to translate? Yeah, or... <laughs> <laughs> sí, yeah. Entonces, lo que pasó es que, efectivamente, partieron el año 98, 99, por ahí. Eh, partieron haciendo eh, covers de Metallica claro, un cover sí. de Metallica tenían un demo como con, con tres temas y un, y un cover de Metallica y la cosa es que para el 2004 por ahí, estaban ya grabando el, el primer disco el Tenet for All Time que fue el que salió eh, el año 2020 pero no les gustó cómo quedó claro, la mezcla no, 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 le, no les gustó la mezcla tuvieron que grabar la batería tres veces porque además no tenía mucha experiencia en cuanto a, a, cómo grabar. a, a grabar en estudio, que era, que era muy distinto a lo que es hoy en día con toda la tecnología, que se puede hacer todo remoto. En ese tiempo había que ir al estudio, pagar por el estudio, entonces era económicamente mucho más difícil y, y, y era físicamente más, más difícil. Eh, y no les gustó cómo quedó el, el resultado de este disco. Y bueno, luego el el vocalista de la banda se fue de, de Grecia porque él estaba para estudiar allá. Entonces ahí como que se... Se, se disolvió se la banda, en el fondo que volvieron a formar, se volvió a regrupar, regrupar hasta que al final del 2020 pudieron sacar The Met for All Time, que es el, disco, el primer disco eh, que los lanzó prácticamente a la fama. Y que claro. estaba hecho con canciones muy... Las canciones antiguas de... La, de eh, y, Empezaron recién ahora a producir canciones nuevas que fue para el Towers of Gold, que es el nuevo, eh, el nuevo disco. Sí. Oye, eh, preguntémosle eh, cómo él describiría su power metal. ¿Qué, qué es lo distinto que hace que, que Secret Outcry sea tan espectacular musicalmente y no sea otra banda de power metal más? Ok, so, how would you describe uh, your power metal? You know, because uh, what, what, what makes it unique and so the sound. And, 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 not, and not the same as other power metal bands. Yeah. I think that, uh, you know, if you want to put a label on our music, I would choose mm -hmm. like epic power metal. This okay. is mm -hmm. what I think our music is. Um, the main difference we have with uh, most modern bands uh, is that, uh, you know, power metal has changed uh, the last uh, 10 or 12 years. It's, it's become more... Uh, popular, let's say. It's not a bad thing. I enjoy a lot of uh, the newer bands, but there has been a shift from uh, writing good songs to writing good singles. It's, uh, it's, uh, th there has been a change there because the, the, the people that uh, want to make a living out of it, they have to compete with the bands that, you know, fill arenas and uh, they, they can get on the way of all the, uh, okay, they released a new single, let's put it on our Spotify playlist, you know, there's a different mentality with the music that we grew up with. I mean, if you're in the range group of, you know, 35 to 45 or even older, then yeah. <laughs> uh, if you're in that range uh, group, the, uh, the power metal that, uh, you know, what uh, most people describe as the golden era of power metal, it was totally different. Uh, back then you had to, you know, uh, buy an album and you had to spend time with the album and you had to look on the liner notes and read the lyrics and really invest your time on it. And that th this is why those albums are, are considered as classics because they weren't made for fast consumption. 
you know, they didn't have that uh, fast food mentality. The, you know, uh, uh, I heard it, I remember the chorus, uh, it's a good song, okay, I will put it on my playlist. It was a totally different uh, um, era. So I wanted to create something uh, similar to, you know, the, the, the kind of music that I grew up with. This is the, mm -hmm. the, the music that I prefer. So, you know, it, for me, it, it comes naturally. I cannot, I have a difficulty, you know, trying to, 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 to write something that, has many hooks and it's very catchy and i i know that you know many people will not be <laughs> on board with that decision because you know as i told you it's a totally yeah. different time but uh, it seems that there's a very uh, there's a gap in the market for this kind of music because there are not many bands that uh, approach the music in the same way that uh, we do and you know as the bands before us the great bands uh, used to do so th th that's that's what i think that uh, you know uh, it's a characteristic, a characteristic of the band that uh, you know might appeal to to some people. We offer something that has been long gone in this uh, kind of music. Okay, entonces básicamente lo que nos explica es que si él tuviese que ponerle así como una etiqueta a, a su estilo sería power metal épico. Y al final la mentalidad eh, que tienen es es la misma mentalidad que hay, que hay hoy en día, que es sacar singles buenos. Lo que pasa es que él dice que el power metal para bien y para mal se ha vuelto un eh, comercial. Claro, Cuando claro. estamos en este momento tenemos a Sabaton, a Powerwolf, eh, como grandes bandas que ponen singles en la radio, acá no en, en, en claro. Chile probablemente, pero en Europa tienen, suenan en la radio, suenan en lista de Spotify, tienen promoción, tienen todo eso. Y eso, eh, si bien es bueno a la vez, produce que las bandas actuales eh, busquen copiar. Buscan eh, copiar el estilo. Sí. O sea, tener que sobrevivir a... Haciendo singles. Claro. Entonces, la, sí, la mentalidad dale. de, de, de Sector Alpha es no hacer eso, es, es, es llevarlo así como a, a, a la época dorada del power metal en donde tú tenías que comprar el disco y escuchabas el disco completo y, y, y no eran singles, era, era un disco al final. Tenías tenía temas así como pensados para un disco, no para singles. Mm. Exacto, o sea, se, se, armaba el disco, se armaba el disco en base a canciones, no canciones armando, no juntar canciones para armar un disco. Entonces, Exacto. ellos tienen esa mentalidad que hace que, que suene tan, tan old school, pero a la vez tan moderno, que es lo que nos gusta de Sacred Outcry. Eh, hablando del, de esto mismo, ¿cuáles son las influencias musicales que inspiraron a Sacred Outcry? ¿Algún artista, banda en particular que haya sido muy, muy, muy significativo en, en la música de George? Uh, okay, so George, what are your influences uh, at the moment of writing? Or what are the influences of, of, of this later the, album? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the, I, I consider my, my two main influences uh, to be uh, Man of War, because, you know, they're my favorite band. And uh, while, you know, we are not exactly in the same style, um, there's a lot of... Uh, influence especially in the way they treat the vocals uh, i think eric adams is the best you know the greatest vocalist that has ever been and uh, the way that they build up the vocal and, and the delivery and um, some tricks they do and the way the you know the, there's always a build up to something greater on the on the vocal side this is something that uh, i really appreciate and i, I try to do as well um, as far as the guitars go My second, you know, favorite band and uh, you know biggest influence is uh, Warlord. If you know okay. the, yeah, uh, Bill Samis has a, a very distinct way of playing, and we have, uh, I hope that we have a, a similar, uh, you know, melancholy style because our music has a, a sort of sadness inside it, and uh, I think that works well because it can help with the atmosphere and you can build much bigger epics with uh, with this uh, this way. So Manor World and Warlord uh, and Domine, the Italian band, if you remember uh, from, yeah, uh, yeah. from the day. Yeah, it, those were the three uh, original, you know, uh, bands that we, when we started the band, the, they were the blue, blueprints to start the band. We wanted to combine because uh, Domine used to, uh, you know, uh, they, they were not afraid to experiment with uh, faster tracks, uh, you know, more power metal uh, oriented tracks, but they, they, they kept the epic feeling going on. So yeah. these three were, were originally these three were the you know the the, the, the main influences. Uh, other than that, of course, you know, Blind Guardian, I love them. One of my favorite bands ever. You know, um, I 
Hmm? What of ours too? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know. Yeah, uh, Halloween, I mean, you, you cannot play this kind of music and not be influenced <laughs> by Halloween. It's impossible. Or Iron Maiden, you know, if you want to get the uh, broader. Uh, yeah, of course, of course. I mean, you know, the, the, <laughs> there isn't a person playing uh, heavy metal or this kind of music that has uh, melodies and uh, not be influenced by Iron Maiden. It, it's impossible. Um, you know, uh, Crimson Glory, uh, Blind Guardian, Virgin Steel, uh, Angra. I love Angra as well. Um, a lot of, uh, you know, the, the older uh, classic, uh, let's Power say. Metal bands. Yes, yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, okay, entonces nos, nos dice que para el tema de las voces, Manowar fue una muy gran inspiración eh, por cómo tratan eh, las voces, en cuanto así como hacer un, un build-up para, para, para que llegue así como a lo, a lo épico. Eh, en el tema de guitarras fue Warlock. Warlock. Eh, que, que, que trata las guitarras como con una melancolía así como muy épica Domine y claro, y nos dice que es imposible hacer power metal y no estar influenciado por Halloween, Blind Guardian Angra Ok, vamos con algunos saludos eh, We are going with the greetings eh, R. Scott, oh, saludos Sí Saludos, George. Oh, hi. <laughs> hi, Scott. Uh, I want to th personally thank Scott because he he's very vocal in uh, every post that we do. He's always there. He's always uh, he very loves <laughs> Yeah, thank you very much, Scott. No, he was <laughs> impressed when I say that uh, we will be interviewing you. Yeah. Ah, really? yeah, he's, he's always here too. Is like, it's one of <laughs> this yeah. uh, Domine Increíble okay. Banda. Uh, Carlos Sepulveda, uh, greeting George in uh, Power Metal okay. CL. En Hobo Mancat, eh, no habla mucho español, pero es un fanático de Towers of Gold. Ah, ah eh, Greetings from Mexico, de Humberto Muñoz. Greetings from Greece. I think that uh, you guys, uh, it's hotter there than it's here, because here it's uh, chaotic. I, I cannot imagine what's, how, how the, the situation is there. Ah, eh, no, in, Ch in Arica, I'm living in the northern part of Chile. Eh, Now it's very, very hot, but uh, he's in the center part in yeah, Santiago it's and it's raining a lot. a lot. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, no, we really have cold. like uh, 46 degrees today. It's, uh, oh, no, it's no, not too much. <laughs> no, uh, oh, fuck. Oh, yeah. Sí. <laughs> eh, sigamos. Eh, eh, empecemos a hablar un poco de Towers of Gold. Eh, ¿Qué nos puedes contar sobre la creación y grabación de este trabajo en diferencia de lo que hizo con Dam, eh, Damned for All Times? You know? Damned for All Times fue un proceso largo porque fue un disco que se planeó durante mucho tiempo, pero Towers of Gold probablemente partió después del 2020 cuando empezó el... Eh, ya se había lanzado el primer disco. Ok, so what can you tell us about the process of recording and creating this, this new album? Uh, uh, and the difference uh, with the first album that, you know, it was planned for a long time. Uh, on this one, uh, did you guys start writing before you released the, the first album, or you yeah. started? Uh, well, the uh, Towers of Gold was entirely composed between uh, 2018 and 2019, 2020. It was we had uh, like eight months of uh, downtime before Down for All Time was released. You know, mm -hmm. before it got mixed uh, and mastered, and uh, we had to find a slot from the label to release it. So I started writing new material uh, while waiting for the for the release of Done for All Time. Uh, the main difference that I would uh, I think that it has with Done for All Time is I, I tried to make uh, I, I never tried to make you know a better album. Uh, that was not my intention. I, I never started off this way. I love Done for All Time. I think it's a great album. So. I wanted to feel like a natural step forward for the band. Uh, it was a concept album, so you know the immersion and the the storytelling had to be on point. It had to be very specific, so you can create and paint all these images because you know the story is very important to this to the songs. Uh, you know, many people try to separate it and they hear a song and they you know do the dishes <laughs> uh, yeah. while hearing a song. This is not the case here. You have to pay attention if you want to you know fully enjoy the album. Um, so uh, I think that the main the main difference is that everything in Towers of Gold had to be bigger. You know, it had to be um, more ambitious. It had to be you know the the story behind it, the performance, the production, the, the 
everything had to 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 to, to show a band that uh, is moving forward. That that was my main uh, my my main concern, and th that was I, uh, you know, my main aim with uh, the album. And uh, I I I don't want to repeat the same album twice. You know, I, I know it's a cliche and many artists and many people that, uh, you know, play music uh, say the same thing, but it wouldn't make sense to, to release exactly the same style and exactly the same album as, uh, you know, we did in that for all time. Uh, plus, you know, in terms of gold, I handled all the songwriting and while uh, well, while that for all time was a more of a collective effort because, you know, we, we used to rehearse a lot and we wrote uh, many people, uh, many, many songs uh, jamming in the studio. Uh, Towers of Gold was more personal. It was more, uh, you know, I had a lot of time. Um, so, you know, I, I tried to, uh, plus we changed the entire lineup. So, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, so yeah, the, the new people brought their ideas uh, on board, you know, after I presented them with the songs and uh, it was a very good fit because uh, every, everyone gave the best and really took the material to the next level. That, that, this is why I think that, that Towers of Gold is uh, so successful so far. I think that uh, it shows that there's a lot of attention to detail and uh, most of the things that I tried to achieve, uh, people, uh, it, they resonate with people and, uh, you know, it, it's all we can ask. I mean, you know, it's, uh, it, yeah. it has been great so far. Eh, bueno, entonces nos dice que eh, Towers of Gold eh, fue escrito entre el 2019 y 2020. Eh, con un periodo de ocho meses entre que se estaba mezclando y masterizando el álbum y que la, la discográfica les dio así como el slot para el, el espacio para, para subir el disco eh, y al final su intención nunca fue hacer un disco mejor que el primero porque el primer disco es buenísimo me, me encanta ¿verdad? entonces eh, la idea era eh, hacer una especie de paso natural así como el una evolución de... sin dejar de ser ellos claro, na pero natural al, al, al proyecto a la, a la banda ¿sí? entonces eh, el primer disco fue escrito así como colectivamente eran todos los, los Instagram además que fue escrito en mucho tiempo porque eran canciones que tenían de años que la empezaron a regrabar verso este que fue una cosa mucho más personal que se grabó directamente él y él juntó a la nueva banda y la nueva banda hizo sí. aportes pero en el fondo fue algo más de él exactamente sí. además que era un, es un, a diferencia del primer disco de un disco conceptual entonces hay todo un trabajo de la historia y él considera que, que como nos contaba que las canciones son parte de una historia, es muy difícil agarrar una sola o las canciones sí. crecen mucho cuando las escuchas en el contexto y cuando revisas, porque realmente yo tengo acá el, el Sacred Outcry y, y en verdad es impresionante que, que para la gente que le gusta el metal a, a la antigua, que el bucle tiene información y que te cuente una historia extra. O sea, no sí. todo está en las canciones, hay, hay texto. Eso, eso es algo que ya no se ve mucho. No, es, cuéntale eso y de hecho le quiero preguntar lo mismo. ¿Cuál es la inspiración a la letra? ¿De dónde a él se le ocurrió la historia de Towers of Gold? Porque es una historia muy entretenida de leer y escuchar. Ok, so uh, we were uh, saying that we, we don't see nowadays uh, so many uh, power metal concept, uh, concept albums. Uh, so where did the inspiration for the lyrics came from? The, the, you know, the, the story, what the uh, story. inspiration well, the yeah, story yeah. because it's very interesting that uh, in the new albums that are conceptual, they don't ex uh, use this thing. You, yeah. you, you, <laughs> you write the story a, a here. With the, the booklet with the, yeah, has a story. The, so yeah, I, you, think, <laughs> I think the story for the booklet took me more time than to compose the songs. No, dice que el que la historia del booklet fue más que escribir las canciones. Uh, well, the, the the thing is, um, you know, I have a thing for concept albums. I love them. I mean, uh, you know, I, it's a thing that uh, I like a lot. If uh, people can write a, a good concept album and it can put you into the world that they're creating, for me, it's the best thing. Uh, the thing is, I was a bit uh, afraid to try it because uh, for me, um, it's a very difficult thing to pull off a concept album successfully. I mean, if you want to create something really good, it's uh, it needs a, a lot of work. You can't have a you know a basic story and then uh, random lyrics that don't explain anything. I wanted everything to be very clear, uh, reading the lyrics, and uh, I included the full story inside. So the people that wanted to get deeper into the the story of the Towers of Gold, you know, they can uh, read everything on the booklet. 
Uh, so the the actual story now, uh, I had an idea. Towers of Gold was originally supposed to be um, if we had, uh, you know, in the parallel universe that we had continued playing in back in 2004 and 2005, Towers of Gold was supposed to be the, the big song of the second album Okay. back then. So I had written, uh, the story was similar, but um, it, it wasn't so detailed, of course, because it, it, it would be one song, it wouldn't be a full album. So when I started composing the, the second album, the first, uh, the first track, musically, I mean, uh, that I wrote was uh, The Sweet Wine of Betrayal. And um, while I was playing and, you know, I was listening to the track, I said, uh, I said to my wife, actually, uh, I told her, this is, this has a, a feeling, it's telling a story, the, the song is telling a story. It would be great if I tried a concept album. And she said, yeah, go for it. I mean, you know, you have the story ready because I had told her about the story she was aware. Okay. So I had to sit down and dissect the story and make separate chapters for each song. And, uh, you know, I added stuff because, you know, it had to be bigger to, you know, to fill a, a full length album, uh, you know, instead of like 15 minutes that uh, the big song was supposed to be. Uh, so after, you know, I, I wrote the basic story, the, the basic outline, I started uh, writing the lyrics after I was done with the music. I started writing the lyrics and after that I put the story in the in a sense that, you know, I don't want to say like a novel because, you know, I, <laughs> I don't feel qualified enough to, to write a novel, but that was the aim. I want it to be like a short story that like the ones that we used to read, you know, I, I used to read a lot when I was growing up, uh, Michael Moorcock, uh, J.R. Tolkien, uh, you know, Robert Howard, all of these guys, you know, they have influenced me immensely while growing up. So I tried to pay tribute to these great authors uh, and I included some, uh, you know, hints and Easter eggs uh, directed to some of uh, the video games I grew up playing with that I loved and, uh, you know, still do when I have time. <laughs> so th there's a million things to find in there. You know, I if you have the same passions on me, uh, as me, then, uh, you know, you, you can spend a lot of time in the booklet. Okay, nos dice que originalmente Towers of Gold iba a ser una canción larga de como 15 minutos. Y la cosa es que, eh, muy claro, Mas, con, con sí. una historia. Y, y básicamente y empezó con, él iba a ser la última canción del segundo disco. Y es una canción larga. Pero cuando empezó a componer eh, el disco, empezó con, eh, componiendo Sweet, eh, Sweet Wine, la canción, y ahí se dio cuenta que esa canción eh, también contaba una historia. Entonces claro, lo conversó y, y, y le dijo, le, le a su señora. Como, oye, ten, ten, tengo, esta, esta es como como historia, Canción. y estoy pensando que quizás podría ser un, un disco conceptual, y la señora le dice vos dale vos dale, y, let's go y, claro, <risa> y, 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 y entonces ahí empezó primero a, a, a crear las canciones y luego a, así como a diseccionar esta historia y, y dejarlo así como, como una parte para cada canción y así empezó a nacer el Sound of Gold y, y claro, no, nos dice que para él hacer un disco conceptual, eh, o, sea, o sea, en verdad para todos, eh, es una cuestión... Es súper complejo, que, porque hacer hilar canciones... Lograr, claro, es difícil lograr hacer un disco conceptual y que quede bien, que sea así como interesante de, de oír, o sea, al, algo que tú estés leyendo la letra y, y, y te meta en, en la historia, ¿cachai? Y él dice que claro, él, él no es novelista, no, no, no escribe novelas, pero creció leyendo novelas de Tolkien, de, de varios autores, entonces... De Robert Howard, de Michael Moore, de que conoció por Elric, Robert Howard conocido claro. por, eh, por Conan, eh, I am, uh, I'll read a lot of that thing, so I know the, the guys. Entonces, entonces al final en lo que hace en este disco es también hacerles un tributo a, a estos autores. Y también a muchos videojuegos de los que jugaba. Y de hecho dice que en el booklet, si tú eres, eres jugador o lees a Robert Howard, lees, vas a encontrarte referencias a su a estos videojuegos. Entonces es como que él se basó en ellos, pero a la vez él dice que sus eh, mejores sus discos que más le gustan. What are you, eh, the conceptual albums that you like more? <laughs> Operation Mindcrime, you know, it's... Uh... Yeah, the all-time best. I mean, uh, from uh, Queen's Strike, it's uh, you know the, the pinnacle of uh, concept yes. albums. It's uh, you know it's one of my favorite albums of all time. Uh, I really like King Diamond. 
that uh, okay. you know uses a full story in its album. You know, it's uh, fantastic. Uh, Angra Temple of Shadows, one of my favorite albums ever. You know, it's, I love it. Uh, fantastic. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, you know, <laughs> I love it. Um, the first two Avantasia albums, you know, the metal opera stuff, because you know later on Avantasia, you know supposedly still has a story but no one gets what it is <laughs> it's very big so, um, Rhapsody I really of like Fire? Rhapsody of Rhapsody, the yeah, you know of course yeah. although you know to be honest Rhapsody although the first uh, like six albums are uh, an entire story etc I yes. never felt the connection I, I couldn't follow the story it was very you know uh, it, it jumped all around although I love the albums uh, and I love the band uh, you know as a concept uh, thing I, I w Never was uh, very much into it. Uh, Arian, have you listened to it? Yeah, I I I enjoy generally all the you know the metal opera type of. Uh, okay. Uh, Sí, le preguntaba cuál era su disco favorito de conceptuales o realmente Operation Mindcrime como el gran, Lejos, eh, claro. mejor, uno de los mejores discos conceptuales de historia. Eh, también lo que hizo Avantasia en, en los Metal Opera. En, en ah, los primeros dos discos, porque el sí. resto de los discos tienen historia, pero, pero nadie, nadie la entiende. entiende. De hecho, dice que los primeros discos de Rhapsody le gustan, pero no entiende mucho la conexión de la historia. Claro, no, no eh, tiene... También nombró eh, ah, Temple, of Temple of Shadows. el yeah, yeah. From Greece, hello, from Greece. I don't know. Never that. <laughs> <laughs> eh, so, eh, dile, mira, una pregunta de Towers of Gold que toda la gente quiere saber es sobre el cambio de cantante. Todos sabemos que en, en Sacred Outcry canta el gran Janis Papadopoulos y después decide, no sabemos por qué, queremos saber un poco más, en rescata, revive de las cenizas a Daniel Heyman de de The Lost Horizon, una banda que todos amamos en los años 2000 algo y que desapareció. Entonces, fue una, fue, ¿cuál fue la decisión de cambiar de cantante? Además, ¿Daniel Heyman es el cantante de Secret Outcry o él también piensa que en un tercer disco va a haber otro cantante? Esa es la... Um, uh, ok, so, about the change of uh, singer. Uh, the, the first album had uh, Janis uh, Papadopoulos. Papadopoulos. Right? Yes. Uh, the, the, the second album, uh, you decided to go with... Uh, Daniel Heyman from Los Orleans. Oh, why? Yeah. Uh, why? Why this change? Uh, and, and, and will the uh, third album have a different singer or will you stay with... Uh, uh, well, let, let's start from the beginning. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, Daniel is one of my, uh, like, top three favorite singers ever. You know, for me, it still uh, feels very surreal that we released an album with him. It's, you know, it's crazy for me. Uh, so when we stopped playing back in 2005, before we reunited to release Done For All Time, uh, I always wanted to work with him. You know, I will, it was a dream because, you know, it was uh, science fiction back in the day. And I always imagined how he would fit our, our style of uh, playing. I thought, I thought that if we could work together, we could create something really great. Uh, when we recorded Dan for All Time, uh, I met Yanis, and uh, you know, Yanis is, I think he's the best vocalist from the newer generation of vocalists. I think that he's the best. Uh, he's at least my favorite. I, I love the guy. And uh, Yanis was uh, such a great guy, and we were chatting, and I, I told him that, uh, you know, I, I have some, we have some songs that I think that you could really do wonders with your voice. You know, you, you could really knock them off. off you know, of course. And, uh, you know, Yanis was on board very fast, so, but he was a special guest. He never was a part of the band. I mean, he, oh. he just uh, was there to, to sing the, the, those songs. Plus, he was very busy and he was getting busier with Beast in Black. I mean, Beast in Black at the moment are it's like, like huge. Uh, you know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, they, they, they're rocking it and they're, they're going great. They released a fantastic, the, the latest album is fantastic. And, uh, you know, they enjoy the very well-deserved success. So, you know, Yanis was never on board to be a full member of the band. He had told me, I knew it. That's why if you see in the liner notes of Time for All Time, he's uh, referenced as a special guest, vocal special yes. guest by Yanis Papadopoulos. So it's, he's not a... Now, the thing is that if you look at the liner notes in Time for All Time, I had hidden a small runic riddle that pretty much said that on the second album, Daniel would be the singer. <laughs> nobody, nobody had found out back then when I released it, <laughs> but, <laughs> and I, I hadn't agreed with Daniel back then. I, I didn't uh, even send him. I hadn't even sent him an email, but it was something that I always wanted to try to do. So you know, I hid it like an Easter egg. So if you if you look inside the booklet, especially in the 
in the in the vinyl version there is a much uh, larger passage on the on the CD version it's a shorter passage but it's it, it's still referencing Daniel and uh, we use that reference to announce Daniel when we agreed if you look on YouTube the announcement for uh, Daniel joining the, uh, we made a video that uh, had you know the inlay of uh, uh, done for all time of the vinyl version and uh, you know the runic riddle and then when translated it was a small like uh, poem let's say that said that Daniel would sing on the second album. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, <laughs> I like I'm to looking. do this kind of stuff. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah the, the, on the CD version that you're looking, if you if you see on the back side, there's okay. a riddle, uh, yeah, the riddle there says, beyond the mountains, across the sea, a legend, a story untold, there's only one warning that all men must heed, beware the towers of gold. So it announced that the second album would be called the towers of gold as well. But, you know, it's, the, those are little things that I like to hide inside that no one gives a shit, but I, I like them, so <laughs> it's good. So with Daniel, we had an excellent uh, cooperation. I think uh, he was very happy with uh, with everything, uh, the quality of the music, the way we worked. Uh, he's very proud of the of the album. He really enjoys it, and uh, you know, we we haven't uh, discussed yet about the the possibility of uh, doing a, another album so quick, but. Um, I've already started composing and I will have to, you know, give him a call and ask because, you know, of course I want him on board. I mean, uh, the idea is to keep doing albums with him for as long as he wants and as long as, uh, you know, um, we can have something uh, that we think it's uh, good to present to people. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, all going well. Uh, Daniel will be the singer for the, you know, the third, the fourth and the fifth album. Uh, <laughs> let's hope. <laughs> Bueno, entonces lo, lo que nos cuenta un poco es que Janis nunca fue el vocalista principal, fue un vocalista invitado para, para el disco anterior. Eh, y que estuvo, le, le, eh, George le, le dijo así como, oye, yo creo que tenemos un, un par de temas aquí que, que, que creo que tu voz podría hacer maravillas para, para este tema. Y estuvo así como a bordo muy, muy, muy rápido, fue como, ya, pero pero era eso, era un vocalista invitado y la idea es, yo siempre quiso trabajar con, con Daniel desde el 2004 y que era así como un, un sueño por decirlo así trabajar con él y de hecho si ven en el disco anterior en, en, como en, en las runas hay como un acertijo que anuncia ahí. Eh, a, a Daniel ahí, ahí mismo que anuncia a Daniel como el vocalista para el próximo disco. El tema es que ahí ni siquiera había hablado con Daniel, entonces todavía no... Es, es, es como un easter egg que lo ocuparon al final para anunciar que, que Daniel iba a ser el vocalista, y cuando efectivamente Daniel apañó a hacer el, el disco, el video así como de, de anuncio era la, la, la runa, este, este acertijo, diciendo él es el vocalista. De hecho, lo dice que es el vocalista de la banda. O sea, en el fondo, eh, yeah. Daniel Heyman is now the, uh, the vocalist the singer of, of, the, uh, of, singer the of Sacred Outcry. Claro, y la idea, la idea es que esté quizás en el tercer disco, cuarto disco y así en adelante. Pero la, la idea es siempre primero tener música buena para, para presentar. Oye, ¿y fue, eh, siempre fue Daniel Heyman? No había ningún otro. No. En el caso de que Daniel Heyman dijera que no. ¿Tenía algún otro cantante? Ok, so in the case Daniel said no, was there another singer you would want to work with? Do you have in mind? Uh, well, um, be, when Yanis told me that, uh, you know, he officially, because we, we tried to keep Yanis uh, doing for the second album as well, and um, there was, um, at some point, there was a, a thought of doing some songs because you know Towers of Gold is a concept album so the, if I wanted I could write uh, roles let's say you know uh, so you know one one role could be to Daniel and one role could be for Yanis etc uh, so when Yanis told me that uh, you know he couldn't sing because you know he's very busy with uh, Beast in Black and uh, he, he can't be you know uh, involved with any other projects at the moment uh, I made a list of some people that uh, you know possibly could work with uh, for the kind of music that I write, but uh, you know, 
the first one that I approached obviously was Daniel, and uh, since Daniel says, uh, "Okay, let's go for it," there was no point for me <laughs> going anywhere else. Yeah. Um, there are many talented singers around the world at the moment, and it's much easier to approach them. You know, due to the internet, you can send a message, and now we have a track record. I mean, we have two good albums out there. People seem to enjoy them. I can tell him we are Sacred Outcry. These are our past releases. This, uh, this is the feedback we have been getting. So, you know, if you want to be, if you want to be a part of the, the third album, you know, you, would you be interested? But uh, I don't try. I, I don't waste my time thinking who I could take uh, unless a problem, you know, presents itself. So, uh, if Daniel says no, God forbid, <laughs> then I will have to, you know, dust up the old <laughs> list and uh, see and see who is available and uh, who could fit in the material that I've been writing. Because the new stuff that I, I am experimenting with, they need Daniel, man. I mean, you know, it, it's crazy. I, I don't think that there are many singers that could pull this off. Uh, no. he, you know, he, he's the chosen one. <laughs> so, so, yeah, ho hopefully we'll uh, keep Daniel uh, on board and uh, have something uh, great uh, in a couple of years. Bueno, entonces, lo que nos cuenta es que eh, originalmente, claro, le, le pidió a Yanis estar en el segundo disco, pero Yanis está muy ocupado con... Beast in Black. Con Beast in Black. Entonces, eh, la primera, la, o sea, la siguiente opción, la, que era en verdad como la primera opción, siempre fue Daniel. Y claro, hizo una lista de cantantes en caso de que no de que Daniel no pudiera, pero la primera persona a la que se acercó fue a Daniel y Daniel le dijo que sí. Entonces, no vio necesario seguir con la lista. Entonces, tampoco se queda en eso, no se queda así como en ver con qué vocalistas podría haber funcionado la canción. Se, se queda con el vocalista con el que funcionó, que fue el primero que, que la aceptó. Entonces, si en algún momento Daniel no pudiera participar, ahí va a haber que sacar un poco la lista antigua y empezar a, a ver otros cantantes. Jaime González, he's, uh, he's a singer from a uh, local band, the Festos. He said, Easter is, music is marvelous. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I really, yeah. you know, the, the, the reason that I, I am doing so much in the booklet and uh, I'm hiding all those little details that, you know, one or two or ten people around the world might notice is that I used to enjoy these details a lot. And it's something that I think it's missing from music uh, nowadays. Yeah. Because we used to buy an album and we would like spend months like, upon it. And like the adverts of somewhere, uh, somewhere a Friday time. Maiden. Yeah, yeah, yeah uh, it's everything. An, it's I, amazing. Stuff like that. Yeah. I remember when I was a kid and I bought uh, Transcendence from Crimson Glory, you know, one, one of my all time favorite albums. I, I spent, you know, I took a pen and a paper and uh, I, I spent time trying to solve because they have a, a riddle as well in a, yeah. in a, in a pack of runes. And, uh, you know, these, these kind of stuff make you bond with an album more. Yeah. I'm not sure everyone, you know, is up to, you know, they don't have time, they don't, uh, they don't care, whatever. But for me, all these details are important. They show a kind of devotion and a kind of uh, love in the project that I think that the mentality of today is uh, is is what people are, are lacking because you know there will always be good music and there will be bad music uh, you know the the attention to the detail for me is very important that's that's why i try to to, to have everything on par i i hate uh, getting a good album and then opening the booklet and be a four page inlay with uh, you know the lyrics in the tiny fonts and that you cannot read everything anything yeah It's lazy, and I don't like lazy. Bueno, eh, nos no dice que a él siempre le, le gustaron estos easter eggs y cosas así, porque demuestran el, el, el nivel de detalle... Eh, de, la, de, de un producto, no es solo la, música. La, claro, y como que se le pone, se le pone esfuerzo al, 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 al proyecto en, en completo, o sea, a la música, al, al booklet, o sea, a él no le gusta, por ejemplo, abrir un booklet y que sean cuatro páginas con la letra en una fuente chica que no se lee nada. A él le gusta que estén esos detalles, es como... Y, y claro, al final hay gente que no los va a pescar porque no tiene tiempo, porque no le interesa, pero siempre hay gente que, que, que busca estas cosas, así como estos, estos pequeños detalles y que lo hace más entretenido al final. Sí. Oye, eh, quería preguntarle porque ya hablamos un poco de, de Sacred Outcry como banda y de Towers of Gold, pero una pregunta que, que nos ha hecho mucho es ¿qué pasa con, el, con Sacred of Outcry en vivo? ¿Cuándo va a empezar a ver 
a la banda en vivo, si ya ha planificado algo, si tiene invitaciones... Si ha pensado en girar, porque por ejemplo nosotros, yo estoy seguro que en, que en Sudamérica y en Chile tendrá una tremenda recepción porque eh, los dos discos son una maravilla. Ok, so we talked about the, the album and the, 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 the studio part of uh, Sacred Outcry. What about the live part of Sacred Outcry? Is there any plans on touring? Or a of it or... uh, at the moment, you know, it's... Uh... Uh, at the moment, there are no plans. It's oh. something that we are actively looking. Uh, we have some uh, very great, uh, you know, proposals for some big festivals around uh, Europe, mainly around Europe, uh, from Greece, obviously. Uh, it's something that we are looking into. Uh, we're not negative about it, but you know, the logistics uh, about this it's um, it's very complicated. People don't understand how uh, many people don't understand how a band works, and we're not a band in the traditional way that we meet up and go for a rehearsal. Uh, Daniel lives in Sweden. He has to be on board. He has to prepare himself. He has to uh, rehearse by himself. We have to get here. We have to make uh, click tracks uh, so the drummer plays with a metronome. Because when you when you're so uh, you know, let's say um, when your music is demanding, you cannot uh, play live and be you know so so. You have to go out and yeah. be great. So. Uh, at the moment, you know, our life is very complicated. I got two kids. They're, you know, they're like uh, three, uh, one year old and three years oh, old. Okay. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. There's not much time uh, for me to spend rehearsing, and uh, and the, the little time that I have free between working and uh, family life, uh, I prefer to spend composing. I mean, you know, it's uh, we have to keep up the momentum, and uh, we have to, you know, uh, I want to keep releasing music yeah. live. Uh, I would really like to play. But uh, until we, I, I mean, you know, if Daniel called me now and said, uh, George, I watched the interview, let's go play live. Then, of course, <laughs> we would put, uh, yeah, yeah, of course, we would put everything, you know, uh, we would find a way to make it work and we would, uh, we would uh, schedule something. But for the moment, it's something that we are looking at, but, uh, uh, you know, it's much more uh, complicated that people, than people think. Uh, at least for us and the way you know our life at, at the moment because we're like four individuals it's have you know it has his own needs his own uh, you know the uh, they have obligations that we have to make sure that no one does something that will be bad for him in the real life part because you know the band for us it's just a, a way of expressing our creativity it's not uh, i'm not making a living out of it you know i don't think Steve, our guitarist, you know, he does, but it's not by playing live. He's a music producer, you know, he mixes and master oh, okay. stuff. He, yeah, so, um, so for us, we have to make sure that everything is in order. It doesn't affect the real life part, uh, you know, <laughs> catastrophically, let's say. Entonces, nos explica que quieren, o sea, están viendo la posibilidad de hacer giras, de hecho, como ofertas de algunos festivales en Europa, más que nada en Europa. Eh, pero el tema al final es la logística, porque Daniel vive en, en Suecia, Suecia, en Suecia, y el resto de la banda es de, de Grecia, Grecia, entonces es, es complicado, complicado juntarse, porque Daniel tiene que practicar solo, así como por su cuenta, el resto de la banda tiene que también practicar así como sin el vocalista, eh, y al final la música también es muy demandante, entonces no puedes eh, tocar sí. en vivo siendo más o menos, tiene que sonar bien. ¿Sí? Entonces está ese problema, también está el tema de que eh, no es, la, la banda no es la fuente de ingreso sí, como sí. principal, ¿Sí? Es, es como la forma en que expresa su creatividad, entonces no pueden... No pueden irse de gira, eh, dejar así como las pegas botadas, ¿cachai? O sea, George, por ejemplo, tiene, tiene dos discos, ¿cachai? De, de un año y tres años. El, el guitarrista es productor musical, entonces es también claro, trabaja en eso. Entonces es, es complicado hacer, hacer una gira. Quieren, quieren tocar en vivo, pero por ahora es muy complicado. Da, Daniel Robledo, eh, hola gente. Eh, greetings to powermetal.cl. Eh, Great band, Secret Outcry. Uh, Damn it for all time was one of the best uh, albums of 2020. Uh, great, Grecia, great country. Uh, thank you, thank you, Daniel. So, ¿qué se viene? Preguntó la que se viene con Secret Outcry. Ya nos dijo un poco de que 
eh, que ya está componiendo, pero ¿cuándo esperaríamos el tercer disco? ¿Sería conceptual? ¿Ha pensado que sea la continuación de Towers of Gold o la historia cierra? ¿Qué hay en la cabeza para ahora? Y además, si George Apalodimas es solo Secret Outcry o tiene otros proyectos dando vuelta. Ok, so, uh, what will happen now? Uh, will there be new Secret Outcry? Uh, when can we expect some new Secret Outcry? And is there any other projects you're working on? Uh, well, uh, the, the idea when back when we started, uh, you know, back when we uh, got back together, let's say, uh, I wanted to uh, be able to release an album every like two years, two and a half years. I think it's a good turnaround, especially for a band that doesn't play live. It's, uh, you know, good enough not to fade away. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> yeah. So the thing is, um, I've already started working on some uh, ideas. We're a long way before you know those take shape and become full songs. But uh, you know, I already have some ideas. Uh, all going well, I will start actually composing come this uh, September October to have the first form of the songs uh, ready to present to the other guys, so they can give uh, their input. Uh, we can change stuff. We can see what works better. I, I I want to speak with Daniel to see if he's on board for the next album because you know this is the most important ingredient. Yeah. You write differently when you know that. Um, the vocalist of Daniel's caliber will sing because you know you can be more free with the vocal lines. For uh, you know, uh, the, the, the melodies that you write for the vocals are very important. Um, many people think that if you have a good vocalist, it's easy to make a good album, but that's not the case because uh, many the, the 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 mistake I think that many people make when they have a good vocalist is that they get lazy and they don't write good songs. They rely solely, yeah. They rely solely on the good vocalist. And I try to write songs that work equally as well uh, as instrumentals. Let's say before the vocals uh, go on top of them, I try the, the, the music to be interesting. If the music is interesting, then if you add a good vocal line and you have a good vocalist, then you know you can do the you know the the, the extra step that uh, many people. Struggle to you know pass uh, a certain threshold. Uh, you need good songwriting. If you don't have good songwriting, you can have God singing for you, but uh, it will still be good, but it will not be great. So uh, I will take my time, and uh, you know if uh, the plan is to keep the entire lineup from Towers of Gold going forward. I, I, we are all very happy with each other. I think that everybody gave their best. You know the. Def Kallion on the drums really killed it. I mean, he brought ideas that uh, I couldn't even think about. He, he's phenomenal. Steve is great on the guitars. He has a very personal style of playing. And uh, along with the you know basic melodies that I write, I think we created something very, very unique in terms of power metal. It's uh, it's not the neoclassical, you know, shredding, let's say. Thing. The, the, the solos are all very emotional. He, he did a fantastic job. And of course, Daniel, you know, I don't have to say the same things again. <laughs> It's impressive. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, so, yeah, uh, if we manage to keep the lineup uh, together, I I really want to see how far we can go and uh, what other areas we can explore. Because, uh, again, you know, we're, we're not going to be a totally different band on the third album, but I don't want to be, you know, Towers of Gold version 2, let's say. I want to, to have some extra influences, some, you know, some changes here and there. I want it to be an evolution compared to Tales of Gold as well. So that's the idea on every step of the way. So hopefully, yeah, every two or every two and a half years, the plan is to have something new to show. Cool. Entonces nos dice que ya tiene un par de ideas escritas y que por ahí por, por octubre ya va a presentar así como al resto de la banda la, las nuevas ideas. Y que la idea es al final, como cada dos años, dos años y medio, sacar material nuevo. Eh, y también la idea es mantener, eh, mantener la, la formación actual, eh, la de Chaucer, eh, ver si es que Daniel sigue, sigue a bordo del proyecto, porque al final nos dice que eh, tener un buen vocalista te ayuda mucho, así como, o, o, o saber quién es el vocalista, te ayuda mucho a saber cómo escribir la, las letras. O sea, cómo, en el fondo lo que dice también... Melodía. 
es que no es que a diferencia de la gente cree no escribir canciones con un buen vocalista no es fa, no es más fácil porque en el fondo no. él, él entiende que lo que es más importante es la canción y que el vocalista tiene que ser un instrumento más entonces en el fondo cuando él escribe trata de hacer canciones que sean instrumentalmente buenas que permitan que Daniel Heyman explote pero él no, no basa su música en que Daniel Heyman sea el, el soporte y que si tú le quitas a Daniel, la canción se caiga. Esa es la idea. O sea, que la banda completa funcione y todos son eh, instrumentos. Que el baterista la rompió, que el guitarrista la rompió, que el bajista la rompió. O sea, en fondo, todos los instrumentos están bien aplicados y Daniel Heyman obviamente es espectacular, pero la canción en sí, sin Daniel Heyman, sigue siendo una buena canción. Claro. Oye, uh, eh, I'm, dale. Uh, but, uh, so, uh... Uh, apart from Sacred Outcry, is there like any projects, any other projects? Uh, um, no, not really. I don't have any time to <laughs> <laughs> okay, do yeah. on the other projects. Uh, we used to have um, another band uh, called The Eternal Suffering. We we used to play a melodic black metal in the vein of uh, Dissection, if you know. Yeah. Uh, totally different music. Uh, you know, we we. St- Surprisingly, we still have some kind of following. We released an album back in 2010, and we're still getting messages when is the second album coming out. So, <laughs> <laughs> there were some thoughts, you know, of uh, trying to do something with the guys there because uh, we, we have some material ready. But as I told you, it, it's all a matter of uh, time at the moment. Uh, time and you know, to, to record an album and to do it properly, you need time and you need money. Damn it for uh, time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Dan for all time is you know the perfect example. It took like uh, 17 years to, to come out. So uh, yeah, all going well. Uh, you know, I, I'm very interested in uh, music in general. I hear a ton of new bands. I am involved. I'm helping some people that um, you know the uh, things that I cannot announce yet. But uh, I'm helping some people with uh, some ideas, some orchestrations, some some stuff but nothing that i'm actively involved let's say as a side project or as a band my okay. whole focus is sacred outcry it's the only thing i'm interested in at the moment uh, and it's something that i want to explore further because uh, i really think that we can make great stuff down the road uh, if we can maintain the lineup and uh, have you know our health and <laughs> positive uh, you know feedback and uh, no it's something that i really enjoy doing so you know so far it's, go- it's been uh, working great bueno, entonces nos dice que no hay en verdad otro side project, así como otro proyecto aparte de Sacred Outright, eh, que tenía una banda... Uh, what was the name of, of your band? Of the, other band? Uh, the, the, the Eternal Suffering. Eh, una the banda Eternal Suffering. Yeah, 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 Eternal it's, uh, Suffering. Uh, yeah. Death Metal, una cosa muy distinta. Black a, Metal me, Sinfónico tipo de section. Claro. Yeah. Y la cosa es que lanzaron un álbum en el 2010 y todavía reciben mensajes así como, oye, ¿cuándo, ¿cuándo, ¿cuándo se viene el, el nuevo disco o algo así? Pero eh, nice. no hubo quizás así como la idea de hacer algo, pero tampoco tampoco hay tiempo. Y que su principal es Secret Art Pride, y ahí está, aunque en el fondo él también está ayudando a alguna otra banda, da, da consejos, hace algunos aportes, pero nada claro, como que él sea un proyecto claro. paralelo, sino que simplemente un invitado. Un invitado. Claro, él, él, él no está activamente participando en esos proyectos. Oye, solo una pregunta, ¿él, él, él, eh, ¿piensa continuar con los discos conceptuales o con Towers of Gold se can, se, fue el final del, del trabajo conceptual y ahora buscaría volver al estilo canción separadas? Uh, okay, so uh, your next album will will it be a, a concept, uh, concept album or your uh, or, or your your no, no, no. the next album is just <laughs> no. Uh, the thing is, I was thinking about it because you know, uh, believe it or not, although it took you know uh, quite a toll on me because I was very invested in it, uh, I really enjoyed it, and you know now that I'm ripping all the fruit of the labor, it's uh, it's great. But uh, I think that uh, the next album won't be a strict concept album. I might have uh, like a trilogy or uh, some songs yeah. with um, with a short story or anything, but like... not uh, yeah, not a strict concept album. Uh, hopefully, uh, you know, if I can uh, be so lucky to keep doing records, I think that uh, I will of course do another concept album. Uh, but it's not going to be the third one. Maybe the fourth or you know uh, whatever <laughs> down the road. But for the next album, it's going to be more. Uh, I, I have some song titles, etc. Uh, what I can give you here's a, 
an exclusive, uh, you know. Uh, yeah, for Power Metal that's here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The next album will be will have some uh, uh, Murkoch references, heavy Murkoch references, uh, like uh, Done for All Time, which had Elric on the cover. Yes. Uh, I, I I'm uh, trying to explore some th- things again about Elric, about Corum, uh, the internal the internal champion um, saga in general. Uh, I still haven't pinpointed exactly the number of the songs and uh, how exactly they will fit into the into the track list, but it's something that I've been toying around with, and I think that uh, I will go for it uh, for the third album. Yeah. Así que, bueno, dale, Francisco, eh, resuelve. Bueno, entonces nos dice que eh, el próximo álbum probablemente no sea conceptual en sí sino que tenga, no sé, una trilogía, así como tres temas que, que formen una historia, porque eh, igual es cansador hacer un, un disco conceptual, o sea, tener que pensar que toda la historia calce bien, eh, que, que la música también sea buena, es, es cansador. Entonces, probablemente el próximo disco no, no, no tenga eso, sino que sean, no sé, dos o tres temas que cuenten una historia, en, entre otros temas que sean así como temas por separado ¿no? eh, pero que sí van a haber muchas referencias a eh, Michael Murko, el creador de Michael Elric Melnivoli y un montón de historias o sea, para pa los que no lo saben eh, Michael Murko es de ser de los I think Michael Murko is like the three more important eh, writers of a fantastic thing like Robert Howard and Tolkien I think Yeah, yeah. Claro, de los tres yeah. escritores más importantes de, de, de la escritura de, de la historia de, fantástica de, claro, de la historia fantástica entonces van a haber referencias a eso. Todavía, todavía no está seguro cómo, cómo implementarlas o, o qué partes exactamente implementar, pero, pero van a haber referencias. Y eso es exclusiva Power Metal. No. Así que, bueno, no sé si te queda alguna pregunta más, Francisco, ya llevamos una hora. No, yo creo que podríamos preguntarle qué es lo nuevo que está escuchando. Ah, sí, eh, eso, eh, pregúntale, ¿qué, qué, eh... qué, ¿qué bandas recomienda? Recomienda no, bandas. Uh, we, this is a, a question we, we ask. Uh, everyone we have here in the mm-hmm. podcast. What new bands are you listening to, or what are you listening to right now? What bands can you recommend us? Yeah. Uh, the, actually, t- 2023 has been a great year uh, so far. Uh, not strictly in uh, power metal in the traditional sense, but uh, th- there's a lot of stuff that I, I love uh, this year. Uh, first and foremost, uh, you know, Triumphur. Triumphur. They're from Green. Yeah, yeah. If you haven't checked them, by all means do. They're like the You know, I won't spoil it for you. <laughs> You'll be in sur- for a surprise. They're fantastic. Um, there's a, another a new Greek band uh, called Protean Sealed. Ah, I, le- uh, I learned. Yeah, yeah. They, they just released their album. It's uh, fantastic. The you know the guitar work is uh, amazing. The, the it's very. I, I wouldn't recommend it to strict power metal fans because it's much more you know epic oriented. But for me, it's. Uh, It's a great album that I enjoy a lot uh, lately. Uh, I love uh, Wings of Steel. In case you haven't checked it, it's amazing. It's uh, you know an album that uh, you know blew my mind when I first heard it. It's like wow, where the fuck did, did these guys come from? It's <laughs> amazing. Uh, and of course, you know the our label mates Darklon released a very good uh, U.S. power metal album. Um, of course, the new album from uh, Smolder or Gatekeeper. The, you know, the, the big U.S. scene, um, they're all great. Uh, what else? Uh, there's all, I listen to a lot of things. Uh, I really like to support the newer bands. And, uh, you know, I think that the essence of carrying the torch and, uh, you know, keep this music alive is on the underground. Because, you know, the, the big bands... Uh, Everyone they knows. Have, Yeah, everyone knows. I really enjoy them, of course. You know, as I told you, I, I'm, an, I'm a very active listener, but and I buy a, a ton of stuff. But I really try to support smaller bands because, you know, people not might understand it, but like this interview that we're doing here, this is a huge help for a smaller band. People don't understand it. Uh, a comment, a like, a share, or, uh, you know, telling your friends about it. Uh, everything helps because you're trying to build an audience and this audience will follow you for the next release. And this, uh, you know, your audience will double for the next release, uh, for, let's say. So you can, you can keep making some of the money back because, you know, it takes a lot of money to be able to maintain a band at a, let's say, high level of uh, performance and uh, 
if you want to make something, uh, you know, that you won't be ashamed to ask for a person to buy your album. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, so, yeah, uh, please uh, never, never think that, okay, I saw this video, I want to push a like or I want to subscribe to the channel, for example, because, you know, it doesn't make a difference. It does make a difference. Yes. I mean, everything does make a difference because, yeah, exactly. Do so, like, subscribe. Yeah. For real. <laughs> Yeah, bueno, no, nos dice que... Eh, sí. Nos recomendó unas bandas. Bueno, a, 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 aparte, nos recomendó hartas bandas. Y nos dice que siempre está escuchando banda, bandas nuevas, bandas más chicas, porque al final eh, la, la antorcha se, se pasa a las bandas más, más underground, más, más desconocidas. Y al final un, un like, un, una suscripción, eh, comentar en un video, cosas así... Ayuda mucho a las bandas, aunque uno no piensa así como ya un comentario no va a hacer la diferencia. Al contrario, sí, no hace. el comentario hace mucha diferencia. Si usted se suscribe, si pone like, nos ayuda. Ayuda a nosotros y ayuda también a, aquí a nuestro amigo George Apalodiva de Secret Outcry. Eh, the last eh, greetings, eh, Alexandros Antoniadis. Hi, George, showers of gold, album of the decade, the great teacher too. Great teacher too. <laughs> Jaime González, transfer is in... Will be in Kiva Truth Rising Tree in October. Performing uh, the walls is uh, an amazing. See, si. uh, Hernan Borges, he's from Power Metal at CL. Yeah. Hi, George. Congrats for the success of the release. I am the impression that there are several great power bands in Greece. However, no many have reached the success they deserve. You think so? Uh, well, you know, success is a relative term. I mean, uh, what is success? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Because obviously he, he's right. Uh, Hernan is right, but. Uh, people are not willing to put the extra mile in uh, being successful because to, in order to be successful, I know my limits. I know that I can't, uh, you know, decide to go on a three-month tour. It's impossible for me. I have my work, I have my family. It's something that I want. I'm not willing, you know, to sacrifice, let's say, to attain a greater level of popularity, let's say, or success or whatever. So, uh, and obviously, you know, everyone knows it. And if you pay attention to all the new releases, it's uh, really obvious that the quality of the material doesn't necessarily mean success i mean success it's relative it's how much you can tour how much you can resonate and or you can ride the wave let's say of what's popular right now you see it especially in power metal it's ridiculous i mean every day there are like uh, 15 bands dressed up like ninjas or uh, whatever because you know yeah it sells at the moment i mean you know you cannot blame them yeah, exactly. It's fun. People like it. They, they enjoy going to the to, to, to live performances. And, uh, you know, that, but this oversaturates the market. And uh, there's a lot of bands that really only care about the image and getting a piece of the pie that uh, some of the bigger bands of the, this gender, uh, like, for example, Glory Hammer, went, which were one of the pioneers on this uh, parody, let's say, metal. Because, yeah. you know, Glory Hammer is parody only in the sense of the concept and the, the way they present themselves. They're a very serious band because musically they're great and yeah. they, they write great songs and uh, their albums are all very, you know, they have a very high level of quality. But the thing is that many people see this kind of success and they say, okay, I can do that too. So they dress up like a whatever. Ninja? <laughs> yeah, yeah. They, they dress up like ninjas and say, okay, we can do the same. And they, they, they write very it's basic not. songs without, yeah. It's not, it's not. But still, there are labels that think that this is what people want because, you know, they, they have a following, so it's only natural. Yeah. So uh, to get back to the question, success is relative and it, it comes down to what you want. If you want to make music just to be successful and perhaps uh, get a paycheck to pay your rent or whatever, then, of course, there are solutions and there are stuff that you can try. If you want to write music not caring about popularity, let's say, then you can... Uh, Try to make something that speaks to you, because if you're not fan of your, if you're not a fan of your music, then you know, for me, there's no point making music. I'm the biggest fan of Sacred Outcry. I mean, yeah. <laughs> it, it, I'm the second one. Make, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it doesn't make sense if you don't make music you enjoy, and you you make music to sell or you know get a thousand extra Facebook likes on the picture or whatever people care about then, you know, you're missing the point. And uh, if people, if this makes people happy, you know, more power to them. But for me, it's, this is not the case. I, I don't really care about any of it. I just want to release the music that I want to hear. Bueno, no, nos dice que al final el tema del éxito es muy relativo. Es eh, personal. 
es, es, claro, es muy personal, al final depende mucho de lo que tú quieras hacer como músico, o sea, si... Si, 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 si quieres... ser exitoso significa disfrazarse y sacar sí, un claro. single famoso para que todo el mundo lo escuche, es, y, te, y te gusta eso, está bien. Si ser exitoso es eh, crear una canción que te gusta a ti y que te hace feliz a ti, está bien. No hay un éxito, pero, no, el éxito no es común para todos. Claro, pero al final, al final uno tiene que ser su más gran su más grande fan, al final, ¿cachai? O sea, sí. ¿de, ¿de qué sirve hacer música si a ti no te gusta tu música? No, no tiene ningún sentido. Exacto. Oye, unos últimos saludos. Vicky eh, Culora hails from Aten, Greece. Uh, <risa> Ah, Vicky. Eh, y en Hernán, eh, I truly hope you guys had, had all the royal mission. You deserve. Apart from Firewind, not many great uh, Firewind bands have managed to build a big audience, as far as I'm aware. But there's lots of great Greek power metal. Yeah. There is, there is. Thank you very much. I really, I'm really glad you enjoyed the album. But uh, yeah, we have a great scene. We have a great scene. There, are, there are a ton of good bands. There are a ton of um, very talented. <laughs> Thank you, Scott. <laughs> um, there are a ton of uh, talented people here, but uh, you know, it's it, it all comes down to what you want. Some people want to, you know, uh, get famous. Some people want to write music. Some people, it, it's it's all good. I mean, you know, there's room for everybody. Yes. Hay espacio para todos, para los que quieren hacer música para ser famosos, para los que quieren hacer música que les guste a ellos. Hay hay de todo. Bueno, eh, vamos a despedirlo, que invítalo a decirle la, una, la última palabra, libertad de micrófono y que se quede un ratito para despedirnos por interno. Ok, so uh, now we're ending the, the interview. Do you have uh, any words? Uh, for the Chilean uh, fans, for the Latin for American fans. The people, the yeah, your last words. <laughs> My last words. Well, to be honest, I, I never thought that I would ever have uh, people that enjoy the, you know, our work in uh, Chile. It's, uh, you know, <laughs> for me, it's very, very strange. There's a lot of people uh, who it. Yeah, yeah uh, it's very impressive and I, I'm really glad. I'm really glad. Because I, I don't want to call people fans because, you know, I, I'm a fan as well of music, not my music. I mean, I, I, I don't see myself as an artist. I'm a fan that writes music. That, that, this is how I treat myself. So I really enjoy it when, when I see people that uh, really love the album. I get a ton of messages, both in my... Yeah, uh, War Drum, yeah, Rodrigo. This is my favorite band from Greece as well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, it, it's very, uh, very weird. It's a very weird feeling for me to have so many people sending me messages, uh, seeing the reviews, seeing the love we'll, we've been getting. It, it's crazy for us and it's great and we really, really appreciate it. I mean, we, we don't have words to thank all the people that... Uh, there's a lot of people doing a lot of work for us. You know, just because they like the album, they, 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 you know, I want to personally thank you too as well because uh, it, it's great. You give us, uh, you give us a platform so we can reach more people to a market that for us it's you know unattainable. We can, uh, I mean, we cannot play live in Greece, no? <laughs> let alone come to the <laughs> so, so for for us it's great, and we need all the chances we can get. So. All the people that do all the hard work, uh, thank you. It's uh, really, really important for us. Uh, and uh, you guys are the fuel that uh, keeps all the engine running. I mean, uh, you know, uh, it's great. I know that, and I've, I've told it a lot of times in the past that, you know, there are many people, many musicians that they say that they write music from the, for their set, for, yeah, sorry, for themselves, because this is my mentality as well. I try to write music that I enjoy. And, you know, if more people like it, then it's great. But, you know, at the end of the day, it's really great to see that your work is appreciated. It's really great. It's, uh, it's an amazing feeling to, to, to read all the words. I, I've, I've read some reviews about Towers of Gold that I couldn't believe that the people went and wrote this stuff. You know, I was embarrassed. I was, I was like, no, no, man, you, you're exaggerating. Tone it down a bit. You know, people love the album. So for me, it's all the reward I could ever ask. Bueno, nos dice que nunca esperó que hubiese así como gente en Chile que, que le gustara tanto el, el disco eh, y que nos da las gracias porque al final... Damos a, el espacio. A, a, al, claro, ¿no? Y, y, a, y a los chilenos y a, y a la gente que, que, que al final escucha el, el disco y, y, y le dice a más gente así como, oye, escuchan este disco, eh, es, es una... Es un, 
una, una pega que, 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 que ellos no siempre pueden hacer y que es algo que los, que, que los seguidores de la banda hacen. Así como empezar a compartir el disco, decir, oye, escúchate esta cuestión, está muy buena. Así, eh, eh, es una cuestión que a veces es difícil hacer como banda y hay que esperar a que los seguidores o los fans de la banda lo hagan. Y al final él dice que no se considera un... un un músico haciendo música para fans, él se considera un fan haciendo música. Así que eso, los últimos saludos, Angel Martin, eh, he, I think he, se equivocó de hora porque llegó una hora tarde. Yeah, he, I think he's a, a little bit late because we already... He is asking things of Daniel Heyman that we answer yeah, well, like an hour ago. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And yeah. Hernán porque Sacred Outcry is the best single thing that came out from Greece than Tzatziki. Tzatziki, yeah. Okay. Uh, when, when you come to Greece, uh, you know, I'll take you out. He lives in Leicester. He yeah. lives in England. Yeah. Ah, really? Okay. Yeah. So it's much easier to meet up. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> okay, George, eh, lo despedimos. Eh, gracias por haber estado aquí presente, que se quedó unos minutos para conversar en, eh, detrás de cámara y, que, y recordar que la entrevista va a quedar en Spotify más tarde, YouTube, Twitch, eh, Facebook y toda la otra plataforma. Uh, ok, George, uh, thanks for being here. Uh, stay a little bit uh, after this because uh, so we can talk a, a little bit after the interview, but uh, the yeah, interview course, will be on Spotify, YouTube, uh, Twitch, uh, everywhere. Great, basically. great. So, thank you, thank you very much for having me. I hope uh, you know everybody had a good time, and uh, thank you again for all the support. Uh, you know, it means the world for us. Yeah, th thank you for for being here. It, it was great. It was great. Okay, uh, eso uh, lo sacamos. Goodbye, eso. George. Bueno, eso fue la entrevista con Secret Outcry, entrevista exclusiva que tuvo Powermetal.cl. Ojo que nos vamos a Backend en la próxima semana, pero quién sabe, salga una entrevista o algo la próxima semana. Estamos ahí en negociando. Vivo, quizás allá. Siempre estamos negociando cosas. Eso, gracias Pancho por conectarte y por llegar a tiempo para salvar la entrevista. Como siempre, nos estamos viendo. Cuídense. Recuerden que si no, nos vemos el próximo miércoles en el programa, como siempre. Y Suscríbanse, denle like. Like y todo eso que nos sirve y que también le sirve a eh, el gran Secret Outcry. Sí, nos vamos. apoyamos entre todos. Cuídense, que estén muy bien. Chau.